Hello everyone, and welcome to the third, and for now, final Shadowbringers Law Bomb Diffusal on the truth revealed of Hydaelyn, Zodiac, and the Asians. If you missed our videos on Light and Darkness and on the Calamities, you should check them out after this one. Now before we take inventory of what we have learned through Shadowbringers, it's important to review what it is we thought we knew and had been speculating about in older content. So what the heck did we think we knew about Hydaelyn, Zodiac, and the Asians. Knowledge of the existence, let alone the nature of Hydaelyn and Zodiac, is not exactly common among denizens of the source, even less so for Novrant. For most, Hydaelyn is just the name of the star or planet upon which we all live. Even Minfilia back in 1.0 had no knowledge of Hydaelyn. The Mother Crystal was a privileged Charlian secret. Hydaelyn does not reveal herself readily, and when she does, she seems frustratingly evasive. Our other sources on Hydaelyn and Zodiac, the Asians, and to a lesser extent Midgard Zormer, have only spoken in riddle and allegory until very recently. Most of what we thought we knew about Hydaelyn and Zodiac came from our interactions with the Word of the Mother back in Heavensward. Through this dialogue, she described how light and darkness once dwelled as one in the depths of the ethereal sea, in a time before life. She uses herself and Zodiac as synonyms for light and darkness, so we concluded that they must be primordial and universal beings, which preceded any other life of light and darkness, order and chaos, growth and entropy, etc. She told us, vaguely, that the darkness, i.e. Zodiac, coveted power, broke the balance between them and forced her to banish him, subsequently sundering the star into shards. Given that we had no narrative for anything in between, we also concluded that this must have happened, as well, at a primordial time, before the existence of life, and that the universe as we know it must have begun with this sundering. Since that time, the essence of Hydaelyn has dwelled within the life stream at the heart of our star as the will and consciousness of the world. All we really had to contradict Hydaelyn's account was the Asian insistence that she is in fact a kind of parasite burrowed into the heart of the star. And what of the Asians? We spoke about the sundering and rejoining in the previous video. We thought that through this wicked work, they sought to return the multiverse to its natural state, from which Zodiac could presumably wrest rightful supremacy. Beyond their desire to restore the natural state of things, we had very little understanding of the Asian's motives. It seemed intuitive enough that Zodiac would be able to manipulate people into his service somehow, even in his excised condition. After all, as the Warrior of Light, we often seem compelled to champion Hydaelyn's goals in relative ignorance of her ends. All we knew for certain was that there was more to the Asians than what appeared. So what do we know now? Well, for starters, we know that man has always created its own gods. Hydaelyn and Zodiac were both first summoned roughly 12,000 years ago. There was, in fact, a world before them a pre-sundered star upon which thrived a Hellenic utopia, the nation of Amorot, self-proclaimed stewards and administrators of the world. Ruling this republic as all but one of the convocation of 14 was at this time the role of those that we now know of as the Asians. The supremacy of the Amoritines seems to have been due firstly to their immense reserves of bodily ether and secondly their ability to wield creation magics. The average Amritine could conjure and make real anything which they could clearly conceive, from inanimate objects and structures to weather effects and even living creatures. They made detailed blueprints for approved creations publicly accessible so that they could be replicated by others and collaborated together for the creation of the few rare concepts that they could not weave alone. Every part of their city and their lives were formed in this way. Now, we know that Amorot was not the only nation upon the pre-sundered star. There were others in faraway lands. We know not the extent to which they shared the power or the knowledge of Amorot, but the Amoritine shades imply that they considered their own powers supreme. Many, perhaps most, of the flora and fauna of modern Highland and Novrant were created by or have evolved from creations of Amorot. 
Furthermore, the modern rites of primal summoning taught by the Asians are derivative of Amritine creation magics. It is only because the summoners have such scant mana compared to the ancients that their primals must drain power from the star. Also, the scions conclude. So, sometime over 12,000 years ago, the star was suffering the throes of a terrible and terribly vague scourge. We have no idea what caused it, and neither did the average citizen of Amarot. All we know is that it spread across the planet, a cacophony of sound from beneath the earth which would distort all creatures that heard it, and cause those capable of creation magics to lose control and compulsively weave their own nightmares into reality. Fiery rain, and an incessant spawning of nightmarish beasts, so we're told. Eventually, it reached Amarot. We've experienced a simulacrum of the results firsthand, and so the Convocation responded with a desperate solution supported by all except one of their number. The 13 remaining members called for the sacrifice of half of all Amritines to fuel the creation of a god. A will for the star, capable of doing what was necessary to save itself and its inhabitants. Zodiac, the first primal. He would rewrite or repair the laws of nature and halt the destruction of the world. And so he did. He also tempered the 13 Convocation creators into his eternal servitude. But a great deal of damage had already been done, and another half of the ancient species had to be sacrificed to cleanse the world, allowing it to recover and for new life to produce and propagate. The Convocation intended to nurture the world to the point where yet another sacrifice of a sufficient number of those new lives could allow Zodiac to return the previously sacrificed Amritines. But for a number of the surviving ancients, probably led by the dissident Convocation member, this was too far. Their position was that enough blood had been spent to feed the Amritines' dark god, that the new and innocent lives should not be forfeited to return those that had been lost. So they too offered up their lives, not to remake life and reality, but to preserve it in the summoning of Zodiac's antithesis, Hydaelyn, formed from light as he was from darkness. The Asian account from here is that the two gods fought until Zodiac was smoked and sundered. Perhaps it was an unintended consequence, or perhaps it was the only recourse, but splitting apart the soul of Zodiac simultaneously split the star's physical and metaphysical composition, its entire reality splitting into 14 identical reductions of the original. And so we have the source and shards. Now at least three beings escaped the sundering intact, although how they did so remains a mystery. Members of the Convocation no less, those Amritines which held the titles of Laha Brea, Elidibus, and Emmet Selk. They maintained their godlike powers, relative immortality, complete memory, and remained tempered by Zodiac. Once they made sense of what had befallen, the trio determined to pursue the original plan to restore their ancient race by forcing the shards to rejoin in restoration of Zodiac and of their world, however long it took. We talked about this process at length in the previous video. If you want to dive deeper, you can do so there. Together, Laha Brer, Elidibus, and Emmet Selk identified the pieces of the sundered souls of their fellow Convocation members throughout the Shards, and employed them into the conspiracy. Thus were the Asians born as the eternal harbingers of chaos upon the Source, and doom upon the Shards, at the genesis of our new world 12,000 years ago. So we have now a reasonably clear picture of the true nature and origins of Zodiac, Hydaelyn, and the Axians, but there are a few missing pieces and quite a few questions that we couldn't even have conceived of before Shadowbringers. Firstly, what caused the apocalypse faced by the Old World? It's hard to imagine that the Convocation of Amarot was not in some way responsible. The trajectory of Final Fantasy narratives of the genre and of fiction in general is such that superficially picturesque utopias always craft their own demise. The Asians are suspiciously vague on this point, and it's difficult to accept that they simply don't know. Next, we now understand that so much of the source of the Warrior of Light's power is that our soul has been partially rejoined. If this happened every calamity, and again with Ardbert proving to be another of our shards, we're now 9 14ths of an ancient Amritine, 
There are a few possible implications that in pre sundered life, we were also the dissident Convocation member. There is some kind of connection here with the Echo. When it first awakens within us, we experience a vision that would make sense to us now as of the final days of Amorot. The Echo is also an ability we share with all Asians, among others. So is the Echo a quality of the shards of an Amritine soul? Of all souls that belong to pre-sundered peoples? Has everyone on the source been partially rejoined? Or only those of us with the Echo? We encountered the souls of Warriors of Light from previous eras that are not rejoined to ours, so what does that make them? What of Ardbit's companions? Of Minfilia? Of Kryle? Did anyone or anything else escape the Sundering? What about Midgard Zormer? Or Ultima? Is the Dragon Star one of the shards? Was it sundered across the shards? Or is it outside of the sundered multiverse entirely? Could the Deus Ex Machina tier relics like the Heart of Sabik and Tutsamati be cases of unsundered tools or weapons? Finally, does the truth of Heidelin and Zodiac's summoning truly contradict what Heidelin had told us in Heaven's Ward? Could it have been that they existed as a single primordial entity at the beginning of time before they were separated and given distinct conscious will through their summoning? If Zodiac was summoned as the will of the star, does that mean that Heidelin isn't? Can they be two conflicting wills? Or is she truly a parasite? If it's not obvious, my head has hardly stopped spinning since Shadowbringers first launched. For now, we can only hope that the next few patches deliver some more answers before they raise even more questions. Until then, we've still got plenty of content to work through. Now that we've covered the biggest lore bombs of the Shadowbringers MSQ, it's time for some lore tours. Novrant is full of fallen civilizations to discover after all, to speak nothing of time travel shenanigans, various void nonsense, and recurring mention of Tartarus. Keep your eyes peeled for the next videos. Thank you so much to my patrons as always, without whom the next videos might not be possible. I'm eternally grateful for your magnanimity and the support that allows me to continue creating something I so love. If you'd like to consider becoming a patron, you can find a link in the description. If you already are, then check out the description for a link to our community discord and PM me for access to our patron exclusive channel where I post behind the scenes information, early viewing links, and discuss current and future videos in production. Patron or no, thank you all very much for watching. Subscribe and drive a car into that stupid bell for more content. And I'll see you next time.